Thanks for joining us for the Hemp Pests and Diseases session of the Milan No-Till Field Day. Uh, my name is Zach Hansen. I'm an Extension Specialty Crops Pathologist um, with the University of Tennessee. Uh, with me today, we also have Dr. Heather Kelly, an Associate Professor and Extension Row Crops Pathologist with UT, and also Madison Cartwright, a graduate student in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. So today we'll be talking about some of the most important hemp pests and diseases that we've observed in Tennessee over the past few years, and also some ideas to think about managing those problems. So before I get started on some of the disease issues that we've seen, I just wanna give a general overview of hemp production in Tennessee over the past few years um, for those audience members who aren't as familiar with this crop. Um, in 2019, there were approximately 3,400 licenses and um, granted by TDA for about 46,000 acres, and approximately half of those acres um, were planted. Nearly all of that acreage was for essential oil or cannabidiol, also known as CBD. Um, but despite that, hemp can also be grown for fiber or grain, although that's typically not being done in Tennessee at this point. And despite some of the information out there that hemp is a quote unquote weed or that it really thrives uh, regardless of pests or disease pressure, that's really not true. Um, it is susceptible to a number of damaging diseases and insect pests, and we'll illustrate that um, in the coming slides. Before I start talking about some of the specific disease issues that we've seen, I wanna make sure audience members have um, the resources that we've produced at um, the University of Tennessee with research and extension. Uh, the first of which is the Hemp Variety Trial publication from 2019. Um, so last year we had variety trials. These were essential oil or CBD variety trials across the state um, from East, Middle, and West Tennessee. And we've compiled all of that information in one publication. Um, actually, the variety trials are the subject of another session in this hemp session, so you can check that out if you wanna hear more details on those trials. Uh, but anyone interested in growing hemp should be aware of this publication. It has great information on um, what we have found with varieties regarding yield, CBD percentages, THC percentage, so that's the chemical that dictates whether or not hemp is a drug or not. Um, and so that's very important information for growers, as well as disease susceptibility. In addition to that, coming very soon, we're going to have an extension publication on hemp pest and disease management. And that will more or less be a more detailed version of the topics discussed in this session, the different pests and diseases that we've seen and ways to manage those. So that should be coming out very soon. And you can check with your county extension agent as to when that comes out. So the first disease I want to talk about, this is probably the most frequently asked question I've had with hemp over the past couple of years, um, and that is hemp leaf spots. So we have seen some varietal differences, but by and large, most hemp varieties are to some degree susceptible to leaf spots, and those are caused by a number of different fungal pathogens, and you can see those listed here. Um, we, in Tennessee, we have found bipolaris, cercospora, alternaria, and curbularia associated with leaf spots. In Tennessee, um, septoria has also been reported in surrounding states. And so there are a number of fungal pathogens that can cause these leaf spots. Um, some of these pathogen names are probably familiar to some growers in the room, particularly cercospora and alternaria. Um, so those are fungal pathogens that can affect a variety of different crops. Now we're pretty early on working on hemp and so there's still a lot we don't know about some of these diseases. And in this case, we don't know which species necessarily are causing those leaf spots. So it's unclear if some of those cercospora pathogens can move among different crops or if they're gonna be specific to hemp. Um, so that's one thing we need to do some more work on in the future. Uh, but regardless, we know that there are a number of pathogens that can cause leaf spots in hemp. So these diseases are gonna be worse under wet and humid conditions, and they're gonna to tend to be disseminated by wind and rain splash. And so one management strategy to think about with these is avoid working in the fields when the plants are wet, 
and also avoid overhead irrigation if possible to keep those leaves as dry as possible. So here we can see some images of hemp leaf spot caused by bipolaris. So this is a fungal disease. You can see those spots kind of start out as light or white spots and they can darken over time. As the disease progresses, the leaves might yellow and they may drop off the plant early, which will reduce yields. And then under a microscope, you can see those spore structures in the images C, D, and E. And those are more for diagnosticians working on figuring out what the disease is. Another common leaf spot disease is Cercospora leaf spot. As I mentioned, the name Cercospora is probably familiar um, to at least some audience members as causing um, frog eye leaf spot, for example, in some crops. So again, we don't know necessarily what species this is, uh, but on hemp, it will cause these dark lesions, often surrounded by a yellow halo. And again, similar to bipolaris leaf spot, if infection becomes severe, it can cause blighting of the leaves and premature defoliation and reduced yields. So something for growers to consider is the fact that we really don't have reliable fungicides to manage these disease problems. And I'll talk about the fungicides that growers have available to them um, with the caveat that we have not tested them at UT in research trials, and so we really don't know how effective they are. And so conservatively, you can probably consider that we really don't have fungicides that will be effective at controlling all of these diseases. So with that in mind, it would probably be a good idea to choose varieties that have some resistance to leaf spots because we know this is an important disease. But that's not the only consideration growers should make. They should also be considering yield components. And so those varieties highlighted in yellow here have low or moderate susceptibility to leaf spots. And so you shouldn't have major problems with leaf spots, but they also have very good yield components. That's both percentage CBD as well as the total green biomass of the plant. Um, which kind of creates the total yield component. Um, so those varieties are OG, Sweetened, and Carolina were some of the best performers in our trials last year. There are a number of other varieties there, and as I mentioned, if you want to know more about those varieties, you can check out that W900 extension publication to see more details about um, not only leaf spot susceptibility, but also the yield components. The second most important disease that we've observed is southern blight. So this is a soil-borne fungal disease caused by the fungus Sclerotium rolsii, um, also sometimes called Athelia rolsii. So you can see in the images here, the most obvious symptom of southern blight is a very dramatic wilting of the whole plant. This can occur at any growth stage from young plants to completely mature plants in the field. Um, if you look closely at the soil line of an affected plant, you will see a dark lesion, usually covered by this white fungal growth, and embedded in that fungal growth are these tiny tan or brown balls called sclerotia. They resemble mustard seeds, and that's where the fungus gets its name. These sclerotia overwinter in the soil, and that's what's responsible for starting disease the following season. And so this is a lethal disease. So the plants will not recover, regardless of any fungicide application. Once they are infected, uh, they're not going to recover. So the best thing to do is remove those affected plants, if possible, to limit the amount of inoculum um, that will overwinter in that field and cause problems the following season. This disease has a very wide host range, so it not only affects hemp, but a number of other important crops. You can see some of those vegetable crops listed there. And so rotating away from this disease is difficult. It's favored by hot, wet conditions and low soil pH, more acid soils, it tends to do better. Um, so the management recommendation for this is to rotate to a non-host, um, some type of grass for two to three years. That will hopefully reduce disease pressure. It probably won't eliminate the disease, but it should help. Um, weed management is important too. We've had several instances, both in Tennessee and surrounding states, reports of fields that have been in fallow pasture for a number of years and then went into hemp and had very serious outbreaks of southern blight. So there are probably a number of weed hosts that can harbor this pathogen um, in a fallow field. Something to keep in mind. 
Um, plowing, especially deep plowing, can reduce disease pressure. Um, I know at the no-till field day, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, um, but it has been reported in the research that if you physically bury those overwintering sclerotia, um, they have a hard time germinating and infecting new plants, and so you can reduce disease pressure that way. Of course, that has to fit into your overall field management plan. Um, as I mentioned, remove diseased plants if possible, and we don't really expect any of the labeled fungicides to be effective, um, but as I said, we haven't tested them directly, and so it's, it's hard to know for sure. Um, but even with the full slate of commercial um, fungicides in other crops, especially pepper, for example, um, there are very few fungicides that work well at controlling this disease. It's just usually not managed well through fungicides. So moving on, I'm going to talk about a few other diseases that we have seen and could be important in the future, but have been less important um, over the past couple of years as far as um, damage caused by them. The first is hemp rust. This is another fungal disease. As you can see from the images here, you'll get these kind of yellow or brown lesions on the leaf surface. If you turn that leaf over on the underside, you'll see these orange um, rust pustules. Those are actually the rust spores, and that's what will spread from one plant to another, um, causing infections. One other thing I want to mention about hemp rust is last year we did see this across the state. I think it first showed up in August um, somewhere in East Tennessee, um, but by the end of the season we had seen it in East, Middle, and West Tennessee, so it was widespread, also in surrounding states and as far north as New York. Um, so this was widespread. In Tennessee, I didn't hear any reports of this causing major, major um, damage to the crops, and in our variety trials, it didn't seem to be highly damaging. We noticed it, um, but it wasn't really a major cause for concern. But I will say last year we had a major dry spell in August that could have influenced this disease. It's probably going to be worse under um, wet conditions, and so it kind of came in during dry conditions, and that may have held it at bay. If it comes in early this season and it's very wet, it could be a different story. So it's something we should probably keep an eye on. Powdery mildew, this is another common fungal foliar disease. Um, this is a disease that causes problems for many different crops. Again, it tends to be species specific to some extent, and so it's different species causing powdery mildew on different crops. Um, in this case, it's Golovinomyces kicaraceiarum is the name of the fungus, and that pathogen also causes powdery mildew on cucurbits. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you have um, diverse crops or your neighbor, a neighboring farm is growing vegetables, it's possible some of the spores might cross between these two crops. Um, now hopefully if you have commercial cucurbit production, um, powdery mildew should be kept at bay in those situations with um, fungicides. And so that can be managed effectively in cucurbits, but again, we don't have that full slate of fungicides in hemp. And so it could be a problem, um, especially if conditions are favorable. Now with this disease, unlike some of those other diseases that I mentioned that are favored by wet leaves, this is a disease that's favored by drier conditions. And so if it's very humid, but we're not getting a lot of rainfall or heavy dews in the morning, this disease can flare up. Um, and it's often a problem in greenhouses for that reason. As the name implies, you'll get this white powdery growth on the leaf surface. It's quite easy to diagnose. Another disease that we've seen in Tennessee and has been reported as a serious problem in at least North Carolina that I'm aware of um, is Fusarium wilt or crown rot. This is a disease caused by the fungus Fusarium. Again, we don't know the species necessarily, uh, but similar to southern blight in the field, this disease will cause a wilting of the whole plant. And if you were to look at the soil line, you will not see that white fungal growth and you won't see those mustard seed looking sclerotia. So that's one way to tell it apart from southern blight. If you were to cut open the stem lengthwise, as this image shows, you'll see a darkening of the vascular tissue or that white stem tissue. Um, it should be white in a healthy plant, but in this case, it's darkened, and that shows that you have some of that um, fusarium growing inside the stem and girdling and basically choking the plant. The last disease I'm going to mention is damping off or root rot. So again, this is a, a disease that affects many different crops. It's caused by um, Pythium and Rhizoctonia, 
primarily. Um, so Pythium is an oomycete or a water mold. And so as the name implies, it's favored by saturated soil conditions. Rhizoctonia is a fungus. Um, the best way to manage this is to avoid um, excessive watering. Also make sure in transplant production in a greenhouse, you're practicing good sanitation. Um, you wanna make sure you're not letting that pathogen stick around and use trays. If you're reusing trays, they should be clean with either sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, or heat treated. Um, if you're using new trays, shouldn't be a problem. Also consider the water you're irrigating with. If it's surface water, like creek water or pond water, you would probably want to treat that um, to make sure it's not carrying some of these pathogens in it. If it's well water or city water, should not be a problem. And avoid bringing outside soil into that greenhouse space. Um, for outdoor production, raised beds, well-drained soil, and avoiding excessive irrigation are the best ways to get around damping off. So the last thing that I'll mention um, from the disease part of the talk are the pesticides that are registered for use on hemp in Tennessee this year. Um, this is the first year we've had EPA labeled pesticides available for growers in Tennessee. Um, so this is good news. It's a step in the right direction for managing these problems. But as I mentioned earlier, we have not tested any of these in our research trials. So we really don't know if they will have efficacy at all or how well they'll work against any one of these diseases. So that's something to keep in mind. Growers may want to, if they want to try using some of these, consider doing a test of their own to see if they're getting activity rather than going all in and spending a lot of money on a product that may not work. Um, the fungicides are Regalia, Amplitude, or Stargus, Exile, and Death Guard. Um, Regalia is a plant extract Amplitude and Stargus is a um, beneficial bacteria. Exile is potassium salts of fatty acids. And DefGuard is another strain of a beneficial bacteria. All of those are, are OMRI listed, which means they're labeled for organic use, um, which is important to some growers. And then three of the products listed here are insecticides that I'm not going to talk too much about, but the same things apply. We haven't tested them. We don't know how well they will work. Um, but those are Exile, Azimax, and Prevacent. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Madison, who is going to talk to us about some considerations for crop rotation and hemp. Thank you. So yeah, I'm just going to touch lightly on some of these considerations um, with crop rotations in hemp. So as Dr. Hansen said, what we've seen so far is hemp is very susceptible to some of these pests and diseases that you'll see of economic importance in other cropping systems. Um, just briefly with the diseases, you have to have three things to have a disease um, pop up in your crops, a virulent pathogen, a conducive environment, and a susceptible host. Hemp is that susceptible host. So when introducing hemp into your rotation, whether for the future or the present sense, just remember that this susceptible host could introduce pests into a field that previously did not have these pests or increase the populations that are already occurring. One thing to consider is the potential of the pest or disease that could be popping up. Just knowing a little bit about what diseases could occur um, and what pests could occur, just know a little bit about their biology. Also remember that rotation is not a guarantee. Something um, to be considered of is the insect hope pests that we've seen. Uh, due to their wide host range, you can't rotate out of them, uh, rotate out of their occurrence to come in and they will be problematic. Moving on to the plant pathogens, you can see these are some of the diseases that we have uh, seen in hemp um, and then some of their other hosts, whether it's uh, traditional row crops such as soybean, cotton, uh, and corn, or your cereals, um, your weed host, your specialty crops, uh, ornamentals, horticultural crops, some of these pathogens are going to hit in a lot of those different areas. So just be mindful of that and their rotation. 
And then uh, the take home message here is really just your site selection. Know your field history, what previous crops have been there, the diseases that could have occurred, um, and the neighboring fields and uh, other ways that these pests could come into your field. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kelly. Thank you. All right, so I'm Heather Kelly. I'm going to be talking about some insect pests of hemp. And so, uh, as with any crops, you can find both pests and predators, or the good insects, in hemp. Um, and really, you can find a lot of insects in your hemp, but only really a few of them are likely to cause significant economic damage. And of course, this does depend on the type of hemp production. Again, whether you're growing it for CBD or the essential oils, which is the main production type. Um, also similar biomass or differently would be seed or fiber, as well as there's some differences uh, in some of our pests when you talk about greenhouse versus field production. And this has been touched on previously also, with hemp being such a new crop, we really do not have a lot of definitive data um, to back up our economic losses on these uh, pests, as well as we don't have good development for sampling protocols and treatment thresholds. And so while we continue to develop those, keep that in mind, while we give you advice on uh, what is a pest, but it's hard to say when it's actually going to cause economic yield loss. So first, uh, insect resources to be aware of that are out there on the internet. Um, there is a work in progress um, for developing insect pest management systems for hemp um, that came out last year in 2019. Also the Colorado State Hemp Insect website, as well as a, a publication on the cannabis aphid. So jumping into the pests, one of the first pests we'll talk about are mites. The two main ones reported in hemp are the two-spotted spider mite and the uh, hump hemp russet mite. And so these are probably the most serious pests in greenhouse conditions. Um, not to say that when you go to transplant some of these infested plants into the field, they might not, they might still continue to cause damage. So on the left of your screen, you see the two spotted spider mite with its eggs, nymph and adult. And then just above that to the right, the webbing from a severe infestation in a greenhouse. And then the two pictures on the right side of your screen, you have the hemp russet mite, the nymph and an adult. Uh, as well as the speckling on hemp leaves caused by the feeding on the very far right of the screen. So next we're going to talk about aphids. There's four main aphids that have been rep reported on hemp. Um, and really the, the first three, cannabis aphid, bean aphid, cotton or melon aphid, um, all are very similar finding them on the leaves usually on the underside of the leaves in different phases uh, as, picture, as in the picture here. And then the root, root, rice root aphid, it actually feeds on the roots. And all of these can reduce the vigor of the plants, possibly making them more susceptible or sensitive um, to other stressors like diseases or uh, lack of water or poor fertility, all just compounding um, on the plant. So um, aphids, the leaf feeding aphids, produce a sugary waste known as honeydew. So with large infestations, the accumulate, accumulation of this sugary um, waste will result in sticky and shiny leaves, as well as then sooty mold, black mold, may grow on the honeydew. And again, uh, the point, the cause of that though, is the aphid infestation to begin with. Uh, and so continuing on with probably one of the most damaging insect pests of hemp is caterpillars. So here, just to name two important ones that feed on the floral parts, you have corn earworm, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about, and tobacco budworm. Tobacco budworm has been reported much less likely in Tennessee, where we definitely see um, corn earworm across the state in all of our outdoor hemp production. Um, and again, so that corn earworm uh, may be the most important pest of hemp grown under field conditions. It is a late season pest. It feeds on the floral buds. And so it can come in a variety of colors in that top picture uh, as shown. 
So what we've observed in just the couple years we've been looking at hemp in the field in Tennessee, it can vary when the peak of corn earworm would actually occur in your field, but we've seen it where it can start to really pick up the last week of July and go all the way through September. And so here are some images of the severe damage that can be caused to the buds from corn earworm. So some of the biology of corn earworm, and again, some additional pictures to show you the variation of it in the field. Other common names for it include cotton bollworm or tomato fruit worm. It overwinters as a pupa in the soil about two to four inches deep. The adult moths begin to emerge in early May and then are attracted to susceptible hosts, which again include a wide host range. Um, each female may lay 450 to 3,000 eggs, and these eggs can hatch in two to five days and earlier or a quicker hatch period when it's warmer in the summer. Larvae develop through what we call instars um, as they get larger and molt. And so this starts a uh, very small instar, is only 1 16th of an inch large, all the way up to 1 and 3 quarters inch large what would we call almost a snake, uh, when we're still just referring to a caterpillar. Uh, each feeds for two to three weeks. Uh, and so the larva then drop to the ground and pupate in the soil. After two to three weeks pass, a new generation of moths then emerge. And so in Tennessee, we usually have at least three generations occurring in Tennessee each year. So some other insects. Um, first, I wanted to say here is some cutworms um, and armyworms, so more caterpillars that you might see, and salt marsh caterpillars. Um, stink bugs also, which might be more problematic if you're growing it for seed. Um, and then also similar plant bugs or ligus. Again, might really not be an issue unless you're growing it for seed. And then I did want to throw in one picture of these are actually lady beetle eggs on the underside of a leaf, not caterpillar eggs. And so again, the lady beetles would be the good guys. They are predatory and you wouldn't want to hurt them. And so again, just some other insects that you might see out in the field, um, but we've not seen them cause high levels of damage to our plants. Although you can see early in the season, the cutworms, if they cut the plant off, obviously that's a complete loss there, but we've not had very many reports of that in Tennessee. So getting to the management options for insect pests, again, just similar with the fungicides, and as Dr. Henson mentioned, um, there are a few pesticides labeled. They are, some are getting labels, but unfortunately, a lot of these products are often only marginally effective, especially when referring to the insecticides. And really that leaves some of our best options to be cultural controls. And one of those is really just healthy plants are gonna be stronger than stressed plants. Make sure you're following other recommended practices like fertility and agronomic practices to have healthy plants to begin with as they'll be able to withstand um, the stress from insect damage much better than stressed plants. And then also biological controls, predatory mites, lacewing larvae and lady beetles, but again, this is more for an indoor or greenhouse setting. And again, uh, just as Dr. Henson mentioned, uh, doing test runs of these in your own production system to see how successful they are in before you invest a lot of money into them is recommended. And again, here's a table um, listing those insecticides that are registered for use in hemp uh, in Tennessee. But again, that asterisk there, these products have not been evaluated, and so the efficacy um, is not known. And um, our last slide for the presentation, again, just to remind you of the resources that are out there, um, the Hemp Variety Trial, as well as uh, news and timely updates where we'll usually um, highlight and advertise some of our newest publications. And so coming out soon with additional information on top of what's in this presentation um, will be the Hemp Pests and Disease Management Extension publication. And so again, you can check with your county agent for that. If you check on news.utcrops.com, we'll also advertise it there once it gets published. 
And thank you for listening to our presentation today and attending the Milan No-Till Field Day.